If you were growing up in Bamberg, South Carolina, in the 1970s, one of the big town events would be the Little Miss Bamberg pageant. You can kind of imagine it. Little kids assembled on stage, singing, performing, hoping to be crowned Little Miss Bamberg. In the late 1970s, a five-year-old girl and her older sister showed up to that contest one year. The Rondawa sisters were the children of Sikh immigrants from India. As they recall it, there were actually two Little Miss Bamberg titles given out, one for white children, and one for black children. And during the contest, the organizers stepped in and said the two sisters would be disqualified because they were neither white nor black. The younger sister says she got a beach ball as a consolation for being disqualified over her race. And she also got to sing the song she'd prepared, This Land is Your Land. Why am I telling you about a five-year-old girl and her story of Southern racism in the 1970s? Because that little girl, Nimrata Nikki Rondawa, is now running for president. Yes, on Wednesday, Nikki Haley, former governor, former UN ambassador, became the first brown and Indian American woman to run for the Republican presidential nomination, becoming Donald Trump's first official challenger. I am running for president of the United States of America. Our cause is right, but we have failed to win the confidence of a majority of Americans. Well, that ends today. If you're tired of losing, put your trust in a new generation. And if you want to win, not just as a party, but as a country, stand with me. She mentioned Trump just a single time in the context of her ambassadorship, but otherwise he was entirely absent from her speech. But another interesting thing missing? The story of that little Miss Bamberg pageant. She used to tell a lot of stories like that, stories about growing up in a place where her family faced racism, where she was at times made to feel different. Dad and I stopped by the local produce market. As he was putting his produce in his basket, I noticed something start to happen. The couple working at the market was getting nervous. They were whispering, and then they got on the phone. A few minutes later, two uniformed police officers showed up. At Thanksgiving, someone had the bright idea to give me the role of Pocahontas in the school play. Did they realize I wasn't that kind of Indian? My turn as Pocahontas marked the beginning of a long parade of little boys dancing around me and doing the American Indian hand-to-mouth. But don't expect to hear stories like that now that she's running. That pageant story? She said she doesn't want to talk about it anymore. It doesn't show all the great things about Bamberg, she told The Atlantic back in 2011. I like to tell a more positive story. A more positive story. What a nice way to describe abandoning part of your own story, your family's story, a story that could have resonated with so many who have been excluded because of their race. Nikki Haley has abandoned a lot along the way to this presidential primary. And so to understand this Republican presidential candidate and her two decades in politics, to understand the party she wants to lead, just look at what she has abandoned and what she hasn't. The Nikki Haley journey from daughter of immigrants to kids beauty pageant to governor's mansion to running for president starts with, of all people, Hillary Clinton. Yes, then Democratic Senator Clinton, whose speech at a local school in 2003 blew Haley away. I walked out of there thinking, that's it, I'm running for office, she later recalled. Oh, you don't remember her talking about Hillary Clinton? Yes, there once was a time when the Republican Haley felt comfortable crediting a Democrat for inspiring her to enter politics. But you'll be shocked to hear that Nikki Haley didn't say a word about Hillary Clinton this week. What she did do was present herself as a winner. And to be fair, she's never lost an election. Yet. In 2004, Haley, who was an accountant, ran for the South Carolina State House against its longest serving member and won. Against the odds. But over her career, Haley has flip flopped over how much her own identity is relevant to her politics. From her time as state representative, what I would request is that um, not only men, but women also realize that there's a place for you here. The only reason we're lowest in the country on women elected officials is because women don't run. Um, but women have proven to be some of the best legislators that we have in our state. To her run for South Carolina governor in 2010, when she said, it's not history because there's the first female governor, it's history because South Carolina will show what a good government looks like. And all the way, to this week. As I set out on this new journey, I will simply say this. 
May the best woman win. All kidding aside, this is not about identity politics. I don't believe in that. And I don't believe in glass ceilings either. May the best woman win, but I don't believe in identity politics. In the same speech, it's become a classic Haley move, selectively choosing to play up or play down her identity while claiming to reject identity politics. It's not just her gender. Let's talk race. She kicked off her inaugural address as governor of South Carolina in 2011, just as she kicked off her presidential announcement on Wednesday by describing herself as the proud daughter of Indian immigrants. Like fellow Indian American Republican Bobby Jindal in Louisiana three years earlier, Haley ran for governor in her own southern state without really leaning into her race or ethnic identity beyond a stock line in a few speeches. As one black state lawmaker later told The Atlantic, there are many people in the state who don't think of her as Indian at all. They think she's just a nice conservative woman with a tan. Gender, race, it all matters to Haley until it doesn't. By the way, back in 2001, according to public records obtained by a local paper, Hilariously, this proud daughter of Indian immigrants identified herself as white on her voter registration, as you do. And sticking with race and sticking with Nikki Haley flip-flops, let's talk about the Confederate flag. In June 2015, a neo-Nazi and white nationalist shot and killed nine black worshippers in a church in Charleston. Photos emerged of the gunman posing with the Confederate flag in the months leading up to the massacre. And what Haley today tends to get most credit for in the many and fawning media profiles of her is her emotional call back then to remove the Confederate flag from in front of the South Carolina state capitol, five days after the tragedy. This is a moment in which we could say that that flag, while an integral part of our past, does not represent the future of our great state. The murderer, now locked up in Charleston, said he hoped his actions would start a race war. We have an opportunity to show that not only was he wrong, but that, that just the opposite is happening. My hope is that by removing a symbol that divides us, we could move forward as a state in harmony, and we can honor the nine blessed souls who are now in heaven. And the following month, she gained national attention and praise when she signed a bill to permanently remove that vile flag from the Capitol grounds. And look, what she did was the right thing to do, and in a southern state, the bold thing to do. But she didn't lead on this issue. She was pressured by business leaders, Republican presidential candidates, President Obama, and yes, by local activists who were putting up signs like this in the days before Haley made her announcement on the flag. Because up until the massacre of nine black people, Haley seemingly had no problem with the Confederate flag. No problem with the NAACP boycotting her state over that flag. No problem with it when she ran for re-election. You know, the Confederate flag is a very sensitive issue. And what I can tell you is over the last three and a half years, I spend a lot of my days on the phones with CEOs and recruiting jobs to this state. I can honestly say I have not had one conversation with a single CEO about the <clears throat> Confederate flag. Oh, well, that's all right then. The CEOs didn't mind, so she didn't mind. She also didn't mind when she ran for governor the first time around and spoke to a right-wing group called the Palmetto Patriots about the flag in a recently resurfaced video. For those groups that come in and say they have issues with the Confederate flag, I will work to talk to them about it. I will work and talk to them about the heritage and how this is not something that is racist. This is something that is a tradition that people feel proud of. Yeah, proud of, she said. In that same interview, she even told them that she would support a Confederate History Month. We asked Nikki Haley's team about that interview. Her spokesperson simply told us Nikki Haley's groundbreaking leadership on removing the Confederate flag from the South Carolina Capitol grounds is well known. OK, then. But maybe you might say all that support for the flag is ancient history. She turned on the Confederate flag in 2015. But did she? Listen to her in December 2019, just four years after the massacre, speaking about the Charleston killer and the Confederate flag with conservative radio host and well-known conspiracist Glenn Beck. Here is this guy that comes out with his manifesto holding the Confederate flag and had just hijacked everything that people thought of. People saw it as service and sacrifice and heritage. He hijacked it? 
Otherwise, the Confederate flag was about service, sacrifice, heritage. What wonderful euphemisms for slavery, racism, and Jim Crow. So again, no, she was by no means some leader with deep convictions about removing the flag. The truth is that in 2015, Haley was doing what was politically expedient for her in the moment. As The New York Times noted on the day she called for the flag's removal, the then-governor had her own political future to consider. The flag would inevitably complicate her selection as a cabinet member or even vice presidential nominee if she wanted either. As The New York Times noted on the day she called for the flag's removal, the then-governor had her own political future to consider. The flag would inevitably complicate her selection as a cabinet member or even vice presidential nominee if she wanted either. Look. I'm sorry, but Nikki Haley should not get some special or extra credit for belatedly, very belatedly, and pressured by others, taking down that flag. And don't take my word for it. Take Nikki Haley's own word for it. In her announcement video on Tuesday, she referenced the massacre at the Emanuel Church in this way. And when evil did come... Police in South Carolina are looking for a gunman following a shooting at a church. Several in victims. Charlotte. We don't know the uh, severity. We turned away from fear, toward God, and the values that still make our country the freest and greatest in the world. Not a word about taking down the Confederate flag as she prepares to appeal to GOP base voters. Funny that. But as I said. Haley's two terms as governor, and especially her post-Charleston moment, turned her into a rising star in national politics. She got a spread in vogue. In 2016, she was in the Time 100. A mixed blessing, though, her blurb was written by Lindsey Graham. And even if she didn't want to always talk about it, she was a glass-ceiling-shattering Republican in a party where some in the leadership were desperately trying after 2012 to bring in more diverse voters. She had a real chance to shape the party. She got the high-profile opportunity to deliver the official Republican response to President Obama's 2016 State of the Union. During anxious times, it can be tempting to follow the siren call of the angriest voices. We must resist that temptation. Yes, that was Haley clearly going after then GOP presidential frontrunner Donald J. Trump. Back then, Haley was one of his most ferocious critics and opponents within the party. And according to Tim Alberta's extensive profile in Politico, her staff warned her that attacking Trump while defending her preferred candidate, Marco Rubio, could be ruinous for her career. But the first Indian American governor of South Carolina did it anyway. She told voters who Trump was. I will not stop until we fight a man that chooses not to disavow the KKK. That is not a part of our party. That's not who we want as president. Donald Trump is everything we hear and teach our kids not to do in kindergarten. And we have seen just behavior over and over again that's unacceptable. Let's pause for a moment. And just imagine that Nikki Haley had kept up those attacks. Imagine that she had talked about what it meant for her as a glass-ceiling-shattering Republican who grew up facing racism to hear the racist words of Donald Trump. Imagine if she had done what Liz Cheney would do a few years later, putting principle above all else, even if it seemed like a career-ending move. All we can do is imagine, because, of course, Nikki Haley didn't do any of that. She fell in line. Governor, are you going to support Donald Trump? Trump in a national hotel. It's great to be in Cleveland. I'll give you this short rate. Is that a no? I would not be here if I wanted, if I didn't want to make sure that Hillary was not going to be the next president. Are you going to vote for Donald Trump? Are you going to vote for him? Of course. Wait, I thought Hillary was the reason that Haley got into politics. And yet, just months after she denounced Trump for not denouncing the KKK, Nikki Haley had been picked by Trump to be his ambassador to the United Nations. All was forgiven. Who cares about the KKK? Donald Trump adding a formal political rival to his team and the first woman. We learned this morning that Governor Nikki Haley has accepted the offer to become U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. 
So, out of the South Carolina governor's office and off to New York, Haley went. Never mind that her only experience in international affairs was wooing BMW and Volvo to build manufacturing plants in South Carolina. And despite her brand as a moderate Republican, quote unquote, Haley's tenure at the UN was marked by a far right, hawkish, and frankly xenophobic foreign policy agenda. Right from the get go, in fact, take this interview she did with the Christian Broadcasting Network in May of 2017. I don't know what the policy of the administration is, but I believe the Western Wall is part of Israel. And I think that that's how, you know, we've always seen it, and that's how we should pursue it. Ten seconds. That's all it took for Nikki Haley to violate a longstanding U.S. policy on Jerusalem. But it only got worse. She doubled down on her support for Israel and its occupation a few months later, when the U.N. General Assembly was voting to implicitly re reprimand the U.S. for changing its position on Jerusalem. In a letter to her fellow ambassadors, Haley wrote, quote, I encourage you to know the president and the U.S. take this vote personally. And she took to Twitter to claim that the U.S. would be taking names of those who voted against the resolution. But it wasn't just Israel. Haley lied about Iran's nuclear program and Barack Obama's nuclear deal with Tehran. She backed Trump's child separation policy, saying neither the U.N. nor anyone else could tell the U.S. what to do. She defended Trump's decision to block refugees and immigrants from six Muslim-majority countries, claiming it wasn't a Muslim ban at all. And if anyone didn't agree with her or the U.S., watch out, this diplomat seemed to say. I wear heels. It's not for a fashion statement. It's because if I see something wrong, we're going to kick them every single time. Real classy. In fact, it's become something of a go-to line for her. I don't put up with bullies. And when you kick back, it hurts them more if you're wearing heels. I wear heels, not as a fashion statement. I wear them for kicking. My heels got taller. We started kicking harder. I wear heels and it's not for a fashion statement. It's because um, it's ammunition. What is it with Republicans and their obsession with violent metaphors? Yes, Nikki Haley, she rejects identity politics, but can't stop talking about her heels. On Wednesday, the former UN ambassador and South Carolina governor announced her historic bid for the Republican presidential nomination. She did her usual proud daughter of Indian immigrants shtick, but then said this. The American people know better. My immigrant parents know better. And take it from me, the first minority female governor in history. America is not a racist country. Haley has boxed herself into a corner. She's the minority female governor, but she's in a party that is in absolute and total denial about the extent of systemic racism and white supremacy in America today. So she has to comfort them. She has to be the brown Republican who tells white Republicans what they want to hear. Even if it means, again, memory holding parts of her own past, her own life experiences with racism, with discrimination. Even if it means when she says America is not a racist country, leaving out that story she used to tell about the humiliating way in which her immigrant turban-wearing father was racially profiled at a fruit stand. I mean, just look at how Haley jumped onto the anti-critical race theory bandwagon. Here's what she said in an interview in 2021. They don't see color, they don't see gender, they don't see anything, they're just kids. And then you're gonna teach them that they're racist. I mean, this is a problem that really needs to stop. Children don't see color. I'm pretty sure millions of children who were bullied from a young age over their race know all too well that kids see color. And again, Nikki Haley knows this. My turn as Pocahontas marked the beginning of a long parade of little boys dancing around me and doing the American Indian hand-to-mouth call. And it wasn't only when she was a child. It was throughout her career in South Carolina politics, vile racism towards her from members of her own party, suggestions that she had not actually converted to Christianity, really dumb questions about her Sikh heritage. In New York City, which you're visiting for a couple of days, a lot of our taxi drivers are Sikhs. Uh, if you get one, are you going to give them a slightly bigger tip? Oh. <laughs> I give the same tip to everyone. Is she really naive enough to believe that none of that stuff about her own identity is going to come back with a vengeance? Now she's taking on the hero of America's nativists and white supremacists, one Donald J. Trump, the former Republican president, who has, according to Peter Baker in Susan Glasser's book, he has said in private that he wouldn't pick Haley as his secretary of state because of her, quote, complexion problem.
Yes, the same Donald Trump whose administration she departed from in 2018 with these words. Thank you, Mr. President. You, it's Nikki. been an so honor good. of a lifetime. An honor of a lifetime. Yes, Nikki Haley was against Donald Trump before she was for Donald Trump, before she was against him again, if she's even against him. When it comes to Donald Trump, Nikki Haley is the pageant queen of the flip-flop, and most especially when it comes to Donald Trump and the January 6th insurrection. You see, in December 2020, while Trump was having his meltdown over losing the election and making unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud, Nikki Haley was downplaying his behavior. In remarks, to, in remarks to Politico from that December, which weren't published until after the insurrection, Haley said of Trump's court fight, this is coming to the end. Up until now, he's not been able to prove it in court. If this case falls through, he's going to go on his way. Then January the 6th happened. And a day later, Nikki Haley had a change in tune, reportedly telling the RNC's winter meeting that Trump was, quote, badly wrong with his words yesterday. And it wasn't just his words, his actions since Election Day will be judged harshly by history. And a week later, she said she was angry, telling Politico, quote, he went down a path he shouldn't have, and we shouldn't have followed him, and we shouldn't have listened to him, and we can't let that ever happen again. Harsh words. But to those who thought Nikki Haley was having a change of heart, I say, LOL. Here she is talking to Fox's Laura Ingram come the end of January 2021. I don't even think there's a basis for impeachment. They beat him up before he got into office. They're beating him up after he leaves office. I mean, at some point, I mean, give the man a break. I mean, move on. And move on she did. By April 2021, she was telling the AP, I would not run if President Trump ran, and I would talk to him about it. And by October, she went even further, telling the Wall Street Journal, we need him in the Republican Party. I don't want us to go back to the days before Trump. But here we are this week. Another U-turn from Haley as she officially announces her presidential run. So what changed her mind? Here's how she tried and failed to explain that to Fox's Brett Baer last month. All of that, when I said that, was before we surrendered to Afghanistan. It was before we saw this high inflation and high crime. It was before we saw drugs infesting all of our states. And when I look at that, I look at the fact, if I'm this passionate and I'm this determined, why not me? None of that makes any sense as an excuse. Now, Trump's campaign did call out some of her contradictions the day of Haley's announcement, but the man himself wished her good luck. He's wished her good luck, while also getting in a dig at her on the Hugh Hewitt show earlier this month. She's a very ambitious person. She just couldn't uh, stay in a seat. I, I said, you know what, Nick, if you want to run, you go ahead and run. Ah, yes, the old ambitious woman as a negative trope. Get ready for more of that, Nikki. Look, it's unclear exactly what path Nikki Haley sees for herself in this race. Is she running as the pro-Trump candidate? Because I think Trump is probably the pro-Trump candidate. Is she running as the anti-Trump candidate? That might have worked if she hadn't gone to work for him and fawned all over him, even on her way out the door. Is she running as the foreign policy voice? Because her record on foreign policy is a disaster. Or maybe she's running as a breaker of glass ceilings, except she keeps telling us she doesn't want to be that person. This is not about identity politics. I don't believe in that. And I don't believe in glass ceilings either. Nikki Haley wants to be the Republican nominee for president, but personally, I don't think she has a chance. Over on, I don't know, Earth 7, Haley could have been the future of the Republican Party, a post-Trump, anti-Trump woman of color who is proud of taking down the Confederate flag and isn't afraid to tell her own party the truth. But over here on actual Earth Prime, the Republican Party has been taken over by far-right loons, white supremacists, and QAnon conspiracy theorists. It's not a party that wants a woman of color or to be told the truth. It's not a party that is ready to be led by people like Nikki Haley. But here's the great irony. People like Nikki Haley, who abandoned everything they claimed to believe in, helped enable the GOP to become this party. So good luck.